Well, it has been it's been a big year. We've had some wonderful presentations. I've mentioned before that my encouragement to look at the our, our YouTube channel and find past talks, but it now gives me great pleasure to come to this evening's talk. So this evening's talk on dispelling climate change myths, how ocean physics can help explain surprises in the modern day <coughs> climate record. It's given by one of our own fellows, Professor Matthew England. He's also a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, and he is in the Climate Change Research Centre at the University of New South Wales and was its founding, founding director. I, I like to say, because this is where I knew Matthew, that he was in fact in the School of Mathematics as an oceanographer at the University of New South Wales, and so was my was my colleague, good colleague and friend. And I'm proud to say that he is my friend, and he's going to tell us tonight about dispelling climate change myths. And so over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Ian, for the introduction, um, and thank you, everyone, for tuning into this talk. Um, it's great to be here and to make this presentation uh, for the Royal Society's uh, last meeting of the year. Um, and uh, the talk is going to be uh, a bit of a tour through climate science, uh, climate dynamics. Um, I'm going to get to some of the surprises in the climate record, some of the recent um, ways that the climate has varied um, a bit unexpectedly. Um, but I'm going to start off actually with a bit of an introduction of all the things that are playing out just as we expected them to. Um, so I'll now um, switch to my slides. Okay, so um, by way of introduction, I just want to spend a bit of time talking about the, the, the very essential um, physics of the climate system and the things we know really well um, after a couple of hundred years actually. Of, of many researchers contributing to this field. Um, all of you will have seen diagrams like this explaining how the natural greenhouse effect works. Basically, the sun heats our planet, which is very fortuitous for life on Earth. Um, the, the Earth warms, and then this radiation uh, heads back into space. And fortunately, we have a, a nice covering, or pre-industrial, we had a very nice covering of greenhouse gases at a very stable level that kept our climate um, at, a, at a very steady level at a very um, equ equilibrated level for sea level, air temperature and so on for, for about 5,000 years. Um, we did unfortunately discover that buried in the ground were a whole um, bunch of fossil fuels, coal is one example, natural gas and so on, that could be used to power transport and, and, and heat, heat buildings and, and give us energy on the planet. And you can see that this um, has absolutely taken off and skyrocketed through the 20th century. And it's, it, emissions are now out of control, actually. Um, and that's not a quote from me. That's some of the leading um, emissions experts who rate these emissions as, as being out of control. We're punched, we've punched through 10,000 million tonnes of carbon per annum for the planet. Um, this is some uh, 40 years after the US President Jimmy Carter was warned to take urgent action back when our, when our emissions were only about 3,000 um, million tonnes of carbon per annum. Uh, the UNFCCC was, was ratified, that's to say, let's not interfere with the climate system in dangerous ways in 1992. And yet, since that time, we've um, raised emissions. We now doubled these emissions from 5,000 up to over 10,000. So we really have a problem. Um, we're addicted to these, uh, this as a source of energy. Um, uh, the emissions are so high that our atmospheric carbon dioxide is going to uncharted territory uh, for at least the last several million years. And so we have this enhanced greenhouse effect on our hands. We have a planet that is being energized with, that, with extra warmth. Um, we have a huge uh, uptake of heat by the oceans, and this is changing our climate system in profound ways. And I wanted to point out quickly, I, I won't, this is a whole talk in itself, but there's, there's several hundred years of research that goes into our knowledge of the climate system today, um, dating back to Joseph Fourier, understanding the basics of, of radiation in the atmosphere, and understanding to the atmosphere's contribution to planetary temperatures, right through several centuries of physicists who've really uh, given us a deep understanding of our climate system, a deep understanding of how greenhouse gases uh, regulate our climate system, and, and the knowledge we have today about this, um, re really by the 70s, uh, we had plenty of understanding that we should avoid raising this, this trajectory of emissions um, any further than where it sat in, in the 1970s. So 
So we have a real problem and emissions need to be reduced urgently to avoid uh, catastrophic levels of climate change. Um, and we've seen plenty of examples of extreme events over the last couple of years. Australia has been uh, at the forefront of that with the bushfires last summer. But where do I come in? So my, my field is the physics of the ocean, the dynamics of the ocean system, how oceans absorb heat, move that heat around the planet, and then how that heat gets back into the atmosphere and, and how it changes the atmosphere uh, when it does uh, get back into the atmosphere and, and also how it melts uh, glaciers and sea ice and land ice and so on. And so this diagram shows you that global warming is, is really about ocean warming. Um, this diagram shows you where all the heat goes to or where, where all the heat has gone to, I should say, over the last century. These greenhouse gases have been increasing in concentration in the atmosphere. And, and we can go looking for the changes of energy in, in the different components of the climate system. And we find that over 93% of that extra energy is trapped in the oceans. The equivalent of four Hiroshima bombs per second are going off in the oceans that's how much the rate of energy is increasing in that system. Um, the heat from the oceans, of course, feeds back into the atmosphere and the atmosphere is warmed considerably. Um, the heat content is not so large there because the mass of the atmosphere is, is, much, is much lower than the mass of the oceans. And then we also find energy over the continents, in the land surface, if you like. And then a, a couple of percent has gone into melting the ice caps. And that's a real worry because um, that raises global sea levels. Um, and has catastrophic impacts at, at the coast. And so this ocean uptake, I often talk about it as being uh, a wonderful buffering of our climate system. That buffering actually even occurs from season to season. Um, but, but this buffering of our, of our climate change trajectory by the oceans is good on the one hand because it actually has slowed the rate of global warming we would have otherwise seen in the atmosphere. But it's, it's not without payback or not without, it doesn't come free of charge. And the reason I say that is that um, warming oceans uh, raises sea levels globally. Um, it melts the ice caps, which in turn further raises sea levels on top of the thermal expansion. It bleaches corals. Um, it changes ecosystems. Um, it intensifies tropical cyclones. And so all of these um, changes to our climate system driven by ocean warming are incredibly costly to society. And, and we can't sort of go on warming the planet and, and thanking the oceans, if you like, for absorbing this heat um, when, when there are knock-on effects in each of these systems um, of our climate system. Okay, so I, I'm going to get to the surprises in the climate system uh, shortly and, and how we can explain them and how actually the fact they've come along has helped us understand the climate system a bit better. But before I get there, I just want to touch on a couple of the large-scale metrics that are progressing uh, to change in, in ways that we projected already 50 years ago. And, and so the first of these is the top left corner. You've got sea surface, uh, uh, sorry, um, air surface temperature. So the temperature of the atmosphere um, at ground level. That's progressively warmed over the last 100 years or so. You can see there's, there's sort of decades of accelerated warming or reduced warming. By and large, this um, has gone up and it's gone up at a level that sees about a degree Celsius warming already. And we've locked in at least another half a degree with our existing emissions. Um, Arctic sea ice has melted considerably. Um, the global ocean heat content, I've already alluded to this. This is shooting through the roof. It's up to about 25 by 10 to 22 joules of heat content, um, extra heat content today than there was just 30 years ago. This is a massive amount of energy that's going into the oceans. And of course, that raises sea levels. This last diagram on the lower right here shows that the sea level ob um, observations are tracking at the high end of the envelope of IC, IPCC projections. Um, and so these are some of the largest scale metrics of climate change that we can observe on, on the planet. Um, they indicate warming um, of the system and, and we can attribute that to greenhouse gases. Nothing can account for this warming signal or the ocean sea level rise signal or the ice melt signal um, like greenhouse gases can. And there's been a lot of studies in this attribution. Solar radiation declined at the end of the 20th century. Um, cosmic radiation does nothing to the system. Uh, there's been a whole lot of you know, alternate theories put out there, generally by um, inexpert commentators, and each of these has been debunked. And so we know greenhouse gases, we know with certainty that greenhouse gases are changing our climate system. Um, this is very well established. Um, and I want to just quickly mention this, this idea of, of projections playing out um, as we expected them to. Um, I want to talk a bit about the group in the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab um, over at Princeton University. That lab's still a, a really valued collaboration, um, a, a really 
valued uh, group that we collaborate with from Australia. Um, they lead the world in ocean and climate modeling. And back in the 60s, they were already running coupled ocean atmosphere models. They led the way and they ran the first transient or time dependent simulations of the response of our climate system to increasing greenhouse gases. And this diagram shows how they had to cut corners. They had to divide the planet actually into three pieces. And it was very clever what they did here. They made the distribution of land over this make believe planet mirror the distribution of land by latitude in our real world um, system. So they could actually simulate just a third of the planet, um, but maintain this land ocean um, geometry, if you like, of the, of the observed system. And they showed it's quite a scratchy old black and white diagram, but this shows that the Northern hemisphere outpaced the Southern hemisphere for warming. So it reached sort of equilibrium levels of warming um, within about 50 years of the simulation kicking off. In contrast, um, the Southern Ocean uh, particular was really lagging that, that change. And that goes to show you this ocean heat uptake effect. Over the Southern Hemisphere, we're very lucky that we have pretty much an ocean-covered hemisphere. Um, the oceans are absorbing that heat. Of course, there is payback to that, as I mentioned earlier, but it actually slows the rate of atmospheric warming that we see in our hemisphere. And, and so this work dates back to 50 years, and I'm reminded of the um, the quote by the Nobel laureate uh, Sherwood Rowland, who, who said something like, what is the point of having a field devoted to making projections when all we do is sit back and watch them come true? And, and this is undeniable uh, with climate change. These projections were in place already. A very primitive form of these projections was in place in the 60s, a more mature form in the 80s. Um, US president being warned we have a problem in the late 70s. Um, and, and I should say that as we go through in time, um, the projections have, have really played out. This is the same simulation I just showed, but um, back when I was a PhD student in about 1990, um, the GFW group sent me their data and I made a, a colorful plot here of the projections. It was scaling where carbon, dioxide's, where carbon dioxide has gone. It was probably a projection for about the year 2040. Um, and it showed this amplification of warming over the Arctic and over the land masses greater warming over land than oceans, um, and, a, and a really slowed down warming of the oceans um, over the Southern Ocean in particular. And so that projection, uh, you know, the simulations for, for, uh, for this um, model were undertaken in the late 80s, so over 30 years ago. And if you look at where we've come in those 30 years, this is the observed um, air temperature trends over about a 40-year period um, into today, and you can continue this to 20 20, it's the same overall picture of Arctic amplification, greater warming over the land than the oceans, a much delayed warming over the Southern Ocean in particular. And you can see all the land masses um, not benefiting, if you like, from that direct ocean buffering um, impact and actually seeing a much greater warming than, than the oceans to, to either side of any land mass. And so, so we really have to sat back and watch these projections come true. It's a real shame because our emissions are now um, scaling terribly high uh, levels. And, and the, the U-turn that we need to do is a technical, technological challenge that um, is really going to put the planet um, uh, th through a process of re-engineering what we do. It will grow economies and will grow jobs and so on. We shouldn't be scared of those changes, but the U-turn we have to do in these emissions is quite confronting. Um, I just want to point out quickly, here's the 2020 anomalies. Um, this is a single year of temperatures you know, we shouldn't see such a, a dominant signal of that greenhouse fingerprint um, here. Uh, when I say we shouldn't, year-to-year -year variations uh, typically will show you La Nina, El Nino impact. So here you can see in the Pacific, we've had a, a decent La Nina this year. You can see teleconnections of that La Nina to, to high latitudes in the Southern Ocean and perhaps over to the North, northern, uh, northern part of North, Africa, North America. Um, but this Arctic amplification this greater warming over land and oceans. This is uh, this greenhouse fingerprint is now coming through in every year of data. In, in the past, we'd have to average a decade at least to see the greenhouse signature. We now have such a scale of climate change that we're seeing our annual anomalies, you know, very clearly showing this projection, this projected fingerprint that we already had um, in our simulations um, from 30 plus years ago. Okay, so so I've spoken a bit about um, the way the climate system has, has changed in ways that we've forecast already 30 years ago. Um, 
that's that's the background to, to my talk now about some of the surprises that have come along. And the reason I want to talk about these is that they often get big coverage in the media, not necessarily the media that I would advocate you read for your um, climate change information, um, but but they 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 do get profiled considerably by by people trying to derail action on climate change. And so the first of these surprises I want to talk about, and I and I suspect a lot of you have heard about this, is that for um, most of the record of the satellite um, observations we have of sea ice around Antarctica, much of the Antarctic sea ice is expanded, especially in sectors of the Ross Sea. And also in the wet LC, a lot of actually contraction in the West Antarctic sector in the Amundsen, Bellingshausen seas. But this led to an overall expansion of Antarctic sea ice and actually a cooling of the ocean temperatures there. And this was a surprise to, to many people. It was a surprise to me um, when I saw this come along because uh, it is definitely at odds with the Arctic retreat. The Arctic retreat has been very dramatic over the northern. Um, uh, hemisphere. Um, ice has retreated considerably, especially during their summertime. Um, whereas in contrast, the Antarctic ice has, has expanded considerably. And a lot of work has gone in to understand this. And, and actually, ironically, much of this expansion of sea ice um, can be linked to um, climate change itself, actually. So I'll get to that in a little bit. But um, this, the reason why I say it was surprising to many people is that our multi-model projections, so our projections, when we looked at all the climate model simulations, um, that, that hindcasted, that sort of went through the historical record with, if you like, a hindcast simulation, so not a forecast, but actually going back and reconstructing the climate with a, with a coupled model. If you take the average of, you know, the 80 or so simulations we had um, for this period, you see that the projection on average was for, an, for a retreat of sea ice around Antarctica. Um, these are the same color scale, so you can see a weak decline in sea ice in, in contrast, it's grown pretty much everywhere except in the Amazon and Bellingshausen seas. Um, there was also a projection of, of quite a strong um, uh, warming of the ocean temperatures in the multi-model average. And I want to explain quickly how that's played out and why that's occurred. And the first thing I would say is that I mentioned before, we take the average of about 100 simulations or 80 or so simulations. Here they all are lined up for how they projected sea ice trends to evolve. These are very small diagrams. You can't make out the details, but we ordered them in this paper from the, the models that, that actually had the most ice growth in that time to the models that actually had the most ice retreat. I should say this came from Ariane Purick's um, PhD thesis. And, and in contrast, we don't have hundreds of Earth, um, Earths to observe, if you like. We only have one planet. We have one planet playing out with a climate record that has these year-to-year -year variations due, due to El Nino, La Nina. It has decadal variability due to modes that I'll talk about in a minute. And it has this for signal of, of climate change, of course, as well. But we only have one observed planet that we can measure. In contrast, we can do hundreds of simulations. And it turns out that about six or so of these models actually had some ice growth going on um, over that record, um, almost as much as the observed for some of them, um, a little bit weaker ice growth for some of the others. But if we take just those six models, and look at what they did over the last 30 or 40 years, how they behaved for those years, it actually turned out that those models had something in common, and that is they, under, they underwent a, a swing in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation or the Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, uh, depending which uh, version of the name you want to use. But it, this, this oscillation of decadal variability in the Pacific is characterized by, by decades of either um, large numbers of El Nino events and relatively few La Ninas or vice versa, um, more La Ninas than El Ninos. And the pattern looks something like this with cooling over the Eastern Pacific and warming in the Western Pacific subtropics, if you like. There's an acceleration of the Hadley cell in the atmosphere um, and a whole, a whole lot, a lot of other impacts that actually also leads to this um, deepening of the Amundsen sea low over, over Antarctica. And so it turns out that in the observed system, we also had this swing of the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation from a positive to a negative phase. It just by, by luck, or I guess probably by bad luck, the satellite record began at a transition time for this um, decadal mode. And so the first couple of decades of the satellite record was in what we call a positive phase. And then the next 15 or so years were in a negative phase. And that gave us a, a mode of variability that impacted the ice growth over Antarctica. And so if we 
if we actually go and re-analyze uh, any simulation, or actually the thing that we did in this paper is we, we re-ran couple models setting the sea temperatures here to, to play out with this um, interdecadal Pacific oscillation mode. And when we do that, we actually get ice growth around Antarctica that more or less matches the observations. And so if, we, if, if you like, these were called pacemaker experiments. If you set the, the pace of these experiments to lock into that interdecadal Pacific oscillation, you do get um, sea ice growth around Antarctica that looks very much like um, the observed. Um, as is often the case in the climate system, there were a couple of other factors at play. Uh, I'll just quickly go through those. Um, one was that over the last 30 or 40 years, the, the westerly wind fields, in, particularly in the southern hemisphere, accelerated and contracted southward, a um, little bit less so in the northern hemisphere. But this westerly wind field, unlike the, the setup of the northern hemisphere that has pretty much land masses surrounding the Arctic, the Antarctic is very different. We have a land mass over the North Pole, sorry, over the South Pole, and the oceans then surround that landmass. So it's almost like a mirror image of the geometry across the two hemispheres. And this setup actually gives you um, all the right ingredients for creating a cooling over the Arctic, over the Antarctic region. And so in the Southern Ocean, when these winds contracted poleward, they actually, um, this is a complicated diagram, but this shows you, maybe just focusing on the top left panel here, this shows you the imprint of a wind ch change on the oceans. Um, uh, so this wind shift um, contracting poleward, uh, this, this is like a, an indication of what sort of one uh, unit of shift of the winds gives you in terms of ocean temperatures. Uh, you basically see this cooling pattern. And that cooling is due to um, both the, the contraction of, the, of storm tracks and the cloud cover to the south and the, and the extra winds that actually leads to evaporative cooling of the ocean, uh, but you also get ocean circulation changes that, and th so down below here, we petition, in, petition that into atmospheric effects and then also ocean circulation effects. And so there was a westerly wind impact in this ocean cooling. And the third factor at play, uh, which is also related to climate change, is that the oceans over the southern hemisphere freshened considerably over this period. Um, here's a, a measurement of the freshening um, estimated from Dirac and Wiffles uh, about a decade ago, showing a cooling over the Southern Ocean. And when you cool the ocean, you actually um, shoal the mixed layers in the Southern Ocean and shallow mixed layers are much more uh, prone to cooling every winter time when the uh, cooler climate comes along. And so we showed in, in simulations, again, going to a climate model. And in a way, we, the best way to describe it is we took climate models and we, we basically imposed this freshening over the ocean. So we let the climate model behave in every way as, as it would have without this imposition of freshening. Um, the one thing we insist is that the model follows this freshening trend. And that impact alone, just that freshening effect, gave us um, a really good match between observed and model, suddenly getting the, the freshening into the ocean. Um, it stabilizes the water column. It leaves the surface layer a bit shallower and a bit more vulnerable to, to cooling during winter. And, and you get this ice growth that actually matches up really nicely with the observations. And so in a way, it, it's surprising. Uh, if, you, if you take these three factors at play, the winds contracting poleward, this um, increased freshening, probably from glacial melt off the continent, um, coupled with um, year to year or decade to decade variability due to the Pacific Ocean, um, it's hard to imagine why this region wouldn't have grown ice. There's three big factors at play, keeping the Antarctic uh, relatively stable to climate change over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Okay, so I do want to quickly mention um, that this surface uh, cooling and ice expansion um, does uh, needs to be factored in with what's happening deeper in the water column. And what I'm showing here is just to let you know that in, in the, in, on the shelf itself, in the deeper layers of the ocean, and this is where the ocean interacts with the ice shelf. So at the surface, you have the floating ice, uh, the sea ice, for example, you have ice shelves that also float, but these ice shelves are deep enough um, to actually get right into the water column, sometimes to up to a thousand meters or more in depth. And it's this um, shelf bottom water that we are concerned about with these floating ice shelves and also with the grounded um, ice um, poleward of that. So there's a lot of Antarctic, West Antarctic ice shelf, a lot of the West, a lot of the West Antarctic ice sheet is actually grounded in the oceans. And, and at those depths, you actually see a significant warming in this sector. And so whilst 
it, it maybe is comforting to see ice, sea ice grow around Antarctica. Um, these ice shelves, this, shows, this diagram shows ice shelf melt around Antarctica. Um, they're really melting very, very quickly in the Western sector. And the growth of the ice shelves around other parts of Antarctica does not nearly um, match this retreat here. And so um, behind these ice shelves are the ice sheets and they contribute to global sea level rise. So the story for Antarctica isn't one that we can sort of be, um, you know, sort of say, well, that bit of the climate system's okay. It's sort of ice is growing and it's relatively stable climate. That really was the surface part of Antarctica. And it was away from this West Antarctic sector where the ice growth was particularly strong in this sector, in the Ross Sea, and also over in the Weddell Sea and eastward. Okay, I want to spend the last part of my talk um, going through another surprise in the climate system that came along, probably got even more media coverage than Antarctic uh, sea ice growth did, and that is this early 20th century so-called slowdown or hiatus in, in global warming. Um, I will show later that it was a real blip on the long-term climate change on a century scale. This is long going to be forgotten about, even, even uh, a few years from now, it'll, it's just a blip on the radar. But um, I do want to talk a bit about it because for about a decade, uh, we did have temperatures relatively stable. And I certainly remember going to talks in about the year 2000. So if you look at where the year 2000 sits in this time series, this is going back to the year 1880, year to year, air temperatures bump around due to El Nino, La Nina cycles. This red curve is probably much more um, relevant, but even that is, is sort of interspersed with decadal or, or five, five year variations in air temperatures due to things like volcanic eruptions. Pinatubo occurred here in the early 1990s, for example. But, but in the, about the year 2000, there was a sort of growing um, narrative at climate meetings to say, well, we've now punched out of internal variability. You know, back here in the record, we had big swings. You know, we had warming in, in, in this sense, superimposed with big variations due to decadal variability. And then here we get to the 80s and 90s, and there's that climate change signal kicking in. And, and I, enough, comment, enough scientists actually were saying, you know, climate change is underway and, and decadal variability will be dwarfed by the signal. And, and the fact is that we had about 10, 12 years where, where the temperature record bumped around at very high levels that didn't cool during that, this time, um, but it didn't take off and warm at this sort of 0.2 degrees C per decade rate that we saw in the 80s and 90s. It sort of stabilized for about um, 10 years. And you saw in, in one of the graphs I showed earlier, you could see the, the temperature take off after that. So it's, it's been short-lived and it's temporary and it's a thing of the past now, but it did have a fair bit of visibility. And so a lot of scientists, including myself, actually try to, to understand this variation a bit better. And, and to understand this variation, you have to start looking at the climate processes that operate across those two decades, you know, from the 80s and 90s with accelerated warming into the 2000s when warming slowed down. And this diagram here shows you an example of just the trend in, air, in surface air temperature from the 90s into the 2000s. So it's about a 20-year record. And you can see this you know, greater warming over, over land and ocean, but you can see this very significant region of cooling right across the East Pacific. This is the same uh, pattern that I showed earlier was, was giving rise to this ice growth around Antarctica. Um, but it also was a big enough signature, this cooling pattern here in the East Pacific was big enough to offset these patches of warming so that there was overall a, a sort of stabilized uh, air temperature value through the early 2000s. Um, and so, I, you know, in this paper, we looked at a whole bunch of trends of properties. That's air temperature over this 20-year period. Um, that really reflects the ocean surface temperature. So there's no surprise to see a very similar pattern here. Um, this is probably one that's worth spending a bit more time on. This is the air, uh, the air pressure, so sea level pressure, um, color, con color shaded, and then overlaid uh, wind vectors. But they're only shown, these wind vectors are only shown where, they're, where they are significant. And you can see that over this 20 year period, there was a dramatic acceleration of the trade winds. Um, these winds blow uh, east to west right across the tropics and in all three ocean basins, but particularly in the Pacific, there was a very strong acceleration of these trade winds um, from the 90s into the 2000s. It turned out when we looked back in the last 100 years of, of, of measurements, and there's very sparse measurements, but the reanalyses that we could look at show that this wind acceleration was about twice the magnitude 
of any 20-year acceleration that, ever, that had ever occurred in the last 120 years or so um, for the measurements we could obtain. It also happened to be about two to three times the magnitude of the largest wind acceleration that you see in climate models. And so there's been some work done um, by others that show you know, why the models may not be capable of getting such a big swing in the Pacific trade winds, why this acceleration, and part of it's due to um, Atlantic Ocean warming. And so um, this big wind acceleration that occurred in the, in the early 2000s up to about 2013 or so, what it did was actually um, change the ocean's um, uptake of heat and also change sea level in profound ways. And so we had this um, situation again where all of the sort of climate change deniers in the US were saying, well, hang on, sea level's largely dropping along the, along the west coast of the US um, and, and actually right down through South America as well. This is actually a sea level decline in the blue shading here of quite a considerable amount, matching in some sense the magnitude of sea level rise over in the West Pacific. And basically the physics of this is very simple. The wind's just blowing from the Americas across towards our part of the Pacific, um, piles war, um, warm water up on this side of the ocean. Uh, warm water thermally expands and obviously uh, has, a, has a greater sea level, but even just the mechanical forcing of piling up um, extra water on the Western side of the ocean, raised sea levels here at a much greater rate than what occurred um, elsewhere on the planet. And so um, this, this wind acceleration didn't just give us a surprise slowdown in air temperature rise. It also gave us you know, a sea level drop on the eastern side of the Pacific and a sea level um, increase over on the West Pacific sector. And so we drew this schematic up to sort of indicate what, what happened. Um, very importantly, a whole lot of heat was buried as well when this occurred. And so these winds they skim across the surface of the Pacific Ocean. They take that surface warm water westward. That piles up on the West Pacific um, uh, here. And, and at the same time, there are these overturning cells. Um, the effects of rotation mean the water gets deflected off the equator and, and gets recirculated in these shallow tropical cells. And this is from observations now, not from any simulation. This shows the observed warming at depth down to 300 meters. A whole lot of heat got got buried during this um, decade in the early 2000s. Effectively, you know, warmth from that would have been um, sort of fed back to the atmosphere, this warmth got buried into the ocean at about 100 to 300 metres depth. It also leaked into the Indian Ocean via the Indonesian archipelago. In effect, taking some of global warming into the deeper ocean beneath where the atmosphere can see it. And um, when we did this paper, we, uh, we actually also ran climate simulations um, to see what would happen once the winds um, slow down or, or go back to go back to their sort of climatological average state, if you like. And so we, when we ran these climate model simulations, a bit like the case I spoke about before with freshening the Southern Ocean, you do the same sort of thing in these climate models. You basically let the climate model play out in every way as it wishes. Um, but but all we did is just to say, okay, you've got to have this wind acceleration occurring over this 20 year period in all other ways it could it could do its own thing and when we did that we actually could retrieve um, this slowdown and warming this is the air temperature record in black here the model projections were were without this um, wind acceleration were showing sort of ongoing warming when we brought that wind effect in we we actually brought the simulations back down to a slowdown for a decade and then what happened after the 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 winds were accelerated, whether we let the acceleration um, uh, decrease back to, you know, let the winds decrease back to their climatological values, or whether the acceleration persisted for a bit longer, eventually greenhouse gases took over and, and actually gave us some warming. And um, so in a way, this was some sort, of, some sort of projection for the future. And you can see here in this diagram, you know, since we wrote the paper in about 2013, it got published in 2014, here are the observations that have come along a couple more years I can add 2019 in here now, sits in about here. But the actual um, bounce, but the rebound, if you like, here's this so-called hiatus. The rebound out of the hiatus was just as strong as what we expected from these climate model simulations. And so just to finish up on, I just want to say, um, you know, make this point that that, that, that plot I just showed was really zoomed into um, these decades here. Here's the, the, the warming hiatus up to about 2014 or so. The warming has kicked up again. If you can see my mouse down the bottom, oops, down the bottom uh, right-hand corner there, bottom left-hand corner, um, the warming has kicked up again. But what we did in this paper 
uh, we went and analyzed all of the projections to the end of the 21st century and where they get to in terms of their warming. And we subsampled those models that just happen to get a slowdown in warming at about the right magnitude. There's only about six or seven of them um, that do. Sorry, I'm wrong. I gave the wrong number. There's about 18 or 19 that do. Um, those 18 or 19, when we look at those models that had this slowdown uh, under a certain criteria, they actually catch up in their warming by the end of the century. There's no statistical difference between the warming that's achieved by those models um, that do that did have this temporary slowdown. And so I just want to finish up then um, by, by saying that really um, this, this decadal vari variation that we saw that we had so much media coverage about, it really was just a very small blip on the radar. It led to lots more understanding of decadal variability. Um, it definitely helped us understand the Pacific Ocean and how it controls global climate, but it really has no bearing on long-term warming. And it was a very unfortunate um, uh, you know, media debate or media coverage of this hiatus that sort of led to some you know, loss of momentum in addressing these emissions increases. Okay, so thank you for listening. Um, just to summarize, you know, the climate system, a lot of its behavior over the last 30, 40 years was predicted already in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, but on these regional scales, you know, the scale of Antarctic sea ice or the scale of the Pacific Ocean or the scale of just a single decade of the record in the early 2000s, there, there are definitely examples when the climate system behaves in a way that surprises us. And when that occurs, um, obviously scientists pounce on that and want to un unravel that, understand it better. Um, but I would say those scientific endeavors, they're laudable for understanding decadal variability. They're, they're um, definitely um, science projects that need to be pursued to better understand the system and give the public confidence that we understand the system well enough um, to be advocating for these emissions reductions. But I would say that long term, the scale of climate change that, that we're expecting to see uh, without the action on, on emissions that we're talking about is so significant and so costly to society that I think they, these really are you know, distractions to the conversation about our emissions reduction. Um, and so I hope, um, I hope um, the slides came across clearly enough. It's funny to give a talk presenting uh, just to my own screen, but I'd, I'm obviously looking forward to the Q&A that follows. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you very much, Matthew. Can you? Am I on? Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Liz. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So, I just encourage the audience to submit questions under the question and answer button. Um, I've got a couple, but I'm sure there's more of them out there. That was a very stimulating talk, Matthew. So, I'm going to probably ask the first, probably dumb question. <laughs> the the um, there seems to me that uh, the winds feature very highly in, in what you've talked about. And uh, we've got the, the these warm winds, and I'm not quite sure, the last uh, part of your talk, not quite sure of the genesis. Maybe I missed, missed that. But then prior to that, you talked about the freshening of the Southern Oceans. Um, firstly, I'd like you to explain what freshening might mean. And then are we looking at two wind systems and how do they interrelate? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Liz. And I want to start by um, just thanking Ian for the lovely introduction and saying he's a valued friend of mine as well. And it was great to be part of the same school as, as Ian for about uh, 12 or 15 years or so. Um, but yeah, back to your question, Liz. Uh, the, so by freshening, um, you know, seawater is salty. And when we talk about freshening, we talk about adding extra fresh water. Um, for some of my talk, I was talking about that fresh water coming from ice melt. Of course, increased precipitation would also uh, freshen the ocean. And that Southern Ocean signature I showed of freshening yeah. to the north, it's, it's largely the rain belts. Um, some of you may have heard of the way Australia's rainfall has shifted southward. So West Australia in particular has dried because the rain belt there has shifted southward. So the amount of rain they get has declined dramatically over the last 30 years. And that's due to a mode of variability that is affected by ozone actually, as well as greenhouse gases. Um, and so that's what I meant by freshening. And that, the reason why it's so important for oceanography is that fresher water um, actually stabilizes the water column. What I mean by that is it, 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 um, we have a surface mix layer and that mix layer is what interacts with the atmosphere. And when you freshen that 
surface, that mixed layer becomes shallower and it means there's less of a reservoir of, of water to interact with the atmosphere. And that changes atmospheric conditions. It also changes ocean circulation. So we're very keen to understand the oceans becoming fresher or warmer because that affects density and that density drives ocean currents. Um, back to your question about the wind fields, I did speak about two wind fields. The first part for the Antarctic ice was the westerly wind field over the Southern Ocean. And like I just mentioned, that's been contracting towards Antarctica, which has big implications for the ocean circulation there. And it probably did contribute to the ice growth um, that we saw over the last 30 or 40 years. And the other, the other wind field I spoke about, um, I might have got the order wrong. When I, so the, the first bit was the, the westerly winds for Antarctica. The, the second part of my surprises in the climate system uh, talk was about the trade winds and, and those winds um, are very much more affected by year to year and decade to decade variations. They're largely um, driven by natural oscillations. So that decadal mode I spoke about in the Pacific is thought to be largely a, a, a natural mode of variability that we've had for many thousands or maybe even millions of years on the planet. Um, and it, it, uh, the, the swing it had in the early 2000s was very strong though, um, mm -hmm. beyond what we'd seen previously. And, and the work that some of us have done has linked that to warming in the Atlantic Ocean. And do you think the fact that people think, you know, this has been going on for for such a long time, it's not really climate change? You know, the argument yeah. that the sea level dropped and it rose on the on the western side is just normal. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's really, it's really paleoclimate's a fabulous contributor to our understanding of climate change. Actually, and that we we use paleoclimate um, and our knowledge of how much the climate systems varied in the past to better understand the sensitivity of the climate system today to greenhouse gases. So we can go back to the last glacial maximum, for example, when CO2 levels in the atmosphere were much lower. We can look at what the climate was like back then, 120 metre lower sea level, glaciers were massive, um, with just 100 parts per million less CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, that tells us a lot about climate sensitivity. And so anybody who says that changes have occurred in the past, uh, two big things, I would say to that is yes, and they're very important for our understanding of the climate system. And we know from those past records that carbon dioxide has a big role in, in controlling our climate. Um, and the second thing I would say is that some of these past changes we see in the climate system are actually remarkably strong, but driven by very subtle forcing. And what I mean by that is the ice age cycles, for example, are driven by relatively subtle and gradual orbital um, oscillations in our in our Earth's orbit around the sun, that subtle uh, change generating an ice age to an interglacial cycle, that's not cause for comfort. Um, it actually shows you that our climate system on Earth is very susceptible to forcing. And so if a very subtle orbital forcing gives us a total deglaciation over North America and Europe and 120 metre rise in sea level, then, then clearly a big whack from, say, doubling carbon dioxide, um, you can expect a big change in the climate system. So, so I see no comfort in the past changes. Mm, okay, thank you, Matthew. Now, there's a clutch of questions come in, so I'll, I'll try and work through them in, a, in an order that fits. Uh, the first one question is, uh, is it likely that the northern hemisphere land masses will heat more and at a faster rate than the southern hemisphere land masses? Exactly, and that's... When, we, when I showed you some of those diagrams from the early projections from the 1970s and 1980s from the GFDL group, this is exactly what uh, was forecast that the Arctic and Northern Hemisphere land masses would warm more. And we've seen that play out. Um, Canada and, and Russia at the moment, um, some, of the, some of the warming over Siberia this last year has been absolutely staggering. Um, you know, a season of 20 degree above average temperatures is just quite remarkable. Um, and so, so that projection was in place already 30 years ago. Actually, when you put up those what I call heat maps, it looked like the, the uninhabited areas of the land masses were hotter. So the middle of Australia, I suppose this is probably not unexpected. I thought the, the fact that colonised areas might look a bit hotter, but the internal land masses looked redder. Yeah, no, and, and part of the reason for that is that as you get into the interior of the land masses, that's where you get away from this buffering effect of the ocean. And so, uh, and that, actually that's another topic altogether, but one I love to talk to, because if you look over Australia, you know, inland Australia has profoundly hot summers. 
but actually overnight temperatures in winter are super cool because you know the oceans buffer all extremes of climate not just warming mm -hmm. um, so you get milder winters at the coast but the reason you're seeing more warming inland is a very good observation because you're getting away from that buffering effect where the oceans draw down heat and so there's greater warming inland but it's not to do with population or, or cities because in fact around cities you can get urban heat island effects um, but but inland it's really getting away from those ocean ocean cooling uh, ocean buffering of okay. climate change right another question is the indian ocean dipole involved and if so how yeah, good question. Uh, the Indian Ocean Dipole uh, is a mode of variability. I spoke a bit about El Nino, La Nina, or, or the Pacific Oscillation, Decadal Oscillation. Uh, in the Indian Ocean, there's a mode of variability that is very important for Australian uh, seasonal rainfall and extremes of temperature. We had a very strong positive phase of the, I, of the Indian Ocean Dipole, or IPO as we call it, uh, last summer coinciding with the extreme uh, bushfire season we had. Um, and we had the same again back in uh, around 2009. We had some terrible drought for about a decade that was due to an absence of the negative phase, which brings us rainfall relief over. So, so it is involved in the discussion. It's particularly important for all the Indian Ocean Rim nations. So Australia is obviously part of the group of nations that is affected by the Indian Ocean uh, temperatures. And our understanding of it under climate change is relatively limited, but the evidence we have is that um, there's a shorter period between extreme positive phases of this um, IO, IOD mode. And that's not great news because we'd rather have fewer of these extreme summer conditions we just had last, uh, last year. Um, but our, our understanding of this mode is, and how it's gonna vary in time is, is much more limited than you know, some of the global scale metrics I discussed. Okay, thank you. So another a science question. Uh, can you explain the mechanism whereby increases in CO2 parts per million lead to increases in temperature? Yeah, I mean, this, this is stuff that was worked out um, uh, many, uh, many, many decades ago, actually in the mid, uh, in the 1850s, uh, Sir John Tyndall uh, from the UK did some of these experiments to, to link um, greenhouse gases and how they, how they work and how they uh, effectively absorb infrared radiation and then they re-radiate that. So, so this is sort of one of the best established aspects of greenhouse gas physics, um, you know, very well established that, that basically any, um, any molecule in the atmosphere um, like uh, moisture, so H2O, <coughs> excuse me, in the atmosphere or carbon dioxide or CFCs or nitrous oxide, all these methane is another one. These greenhouse gases are with at least three um, uh, mole, you know, at least three molecules. I'm not a very good chemist. <laughs> uh, um, they, they act as greenhouse gases. They, they um, basically absorb infrared radiation and then, and then re-emit that both back to space and also back onto, down to planet Earth. Okay. Thank you. Now, these are more political questions here. Um, for 50 years, we fought the tobacco industry to reduce cigarette smoking. Now we see fossil fuel companies using the same kind of arguments against climate science. Are they deliberately using the same techniques as the tobacco industry used and what should we do about it? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And uh, my friend Naomi Oreskes, a Harvard professor who's an expert in the philosophy of science, has written a whole book about this um, called The Merchants of Doubt. And, mm -hmm. and she goes through this, and I recommend it. it's a great read. Uh, it's a little bit of an upsetting read because it does show you that, um, you know, the, the lobbyists behind um, clouding the science behind tobacco links to health, um, the same lobbying texts have been used. And, and actually seeding doubt, her argument in her book is that seeding doubt is the most important thing. You don't actually need to even win the argument, but if you seed doubt, that's enough to slow down action. And it's a real shame. Um, it happened with CFCs actually, when the ozone hole was discovered in the seventies, initially there was a big push to derail that science. Uh, but actually very soon after that science came along, um, a replacement to CFCs was discovered, HCFCs, and, and they don't destroy the ozone hole. And then the, the, the deniers, if you like, went quiet because it no longer was. <laughs> so it, it is a shame. And it's something that it's, it's upsetting as a scientist to um, work in a field and to know some of the established facts mm -hmm. um, that, have, that are on the, the shoulders of giants, if you like. The, the timeline I showed before uh, highlighted some of the world's greatest scientists um, to have worked um, 
on problems and, and to see their science that's some, in some cases over 100 years old uh, um, sort of somehow muddied. Um, so it's a big topic and I can talk for, for far too long, unfortunately. <laughs> As you say, it's a bit depressing. So the segue from that to that is, uh, what would you say to politicians in Australia today to stir action in reducing greenhouse gas emissions? So the two big things I would say, well, actually a couple of things. I did get to say this to um, Minister Hunt when he was Environment Minister. There was a Senate inquiry that I was fortunate enough to, to give evidence to. And what I said to him was that, you know, we may only be 1% of the world's emissions or 1.5%, but we actually are subject to 100% of the impacts of climate change, whether it's the spread of ma malaria transmission, bleaching of coral reefs, heat waves, bushfire seasons, sea level rise, intensified tropical cyclones, flooding rains to the north of our continent, severe droughts to the south. There is no single impact of climate change I can think of um, that we are not impacted by. And so we have a real vested interest. Um, and actually there was a study that looked at all of the nations of the world and their vulnerability to climate change. and so say Switzerland was very low on that ranking. They, they don't have sea level rise to deal with. They may have some shifts in rainfall. It's a cold climate, you know, they're not so vulnerable. Uh, Australia was ranked second just behind China as the second most nation of all 200 in our vulnerability to climate change. And so we've got a real vested interest. We've got a, an interest in actually getting global action, leading uh, with abundance of solar energy hitting our continent. We have the means to to influence the international stage. We have the means to um, take advantage of that solar energy. We've got outstanding solar experts, including the group here at University of New South Wales, pushing new technologies um, that, will, that will deliver us power sources that don't rely on carbon. And so Australia really has a huge interest in, in leading here because we are so vulnerable to climate change and we have both the natural environment via great solar radiation hitting our nation and the technology skill via um, solar PV industry uh, to, to lead. And it's, it's been a great shame for me to see in action because this will grow jobs. It will grow a new economy. Um, you know, no, no, if you look at economic growth over the last hundred years, it really, you know, out of the second world war, a huge rebound of the economy because we had to fix things up and, and there's going to be a, a lot of growth and the fear about jobs loss, is unfounded. The, the example of solar radiation, of solar panels, I just mentioned. Um, Martin Green, I saw give an outstanding talk a couple of years ago, where he showed the mining required to deliver solar panels to the world. The mining industry is not going to be ruined by going to solar PV. It's actually going to surge. We're not going to be digging up coal. We're digging up other uh, precious metals and so on. And so we shouldn't be fearful of change, and we shouldn't also be. Um, convinced by the people trying to derail progress that, that this is going to be, you know, the end of, the, of a thriving economy here in Australia or, or in other nations around the world. Mm. Matthew, that's a, a wonderful point at which to end uh, the question. But there's a couple more have actually snuck in. <laughs> one, one is a, another sciencey one, so I'll just put them, put them out to you. Um, are we close to uncontrollable methane release in the Northern Hemisphere? Yeah, that's not an area I'm too expert in at all, methane release from permafrost, but it is a real concern. I don't know if you've seen these YouTube videos, the person asking the question, you see people lighting a, a lighter over some of the permafrost melt regions and huge flares of methane. I mean, basically the methane locked under the permafrost there gets released when that permafrost melts. And there are concerns that that's, there's a tipping point there. Once you push en enough permafrost out of the system, these methane hydrates then uh, fluxes into the atmosphere. Um, methane is a huge concern for its, it's a very potent greenhouse gas, um, but if we could change our agricultural practices to limit methane emissions and if the permafrost um, issue is not, doesn't go down the path of um, uncontrolled emissions out of the ground, then the good thing about methane, the positive news there is that it's only got about a 10 year lifetime in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so you hear a lot more about carbon dioxide, not because it's a more powerful greenhouse gas. It's actually less powerful than methane. But unfortunately, carbon dioxide takes hundreds of thousands of years to, to, to get out of the atmosphere. The formation of coal through decomposed vegetation uh, is a multi hundred thousand, well, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of year process. Uh, 
So putting CO2 in the, into the atmosphere by burning coal takes you an instant. To, to get rid of it is a many, many thousand year um, uptake process. Methane has a much shorter lifetime in the atmosphere and we talk about it a lot less, but it is still a very powerful greenhouse gas and one we should be concerned about. Thank you. So uh, one more. Uh, this comes from Cambridge where the uh, member of the audience is freezing to death and says, bring on global warming. <laughs> Great to hear uh, from you, Herbert. <laughs> <laughs> but quite seriously, uh, wishes to raise the issue that, that um, Ian talked about, that it was a woman um, who uh, made the same, ex Eunice Foote, who made the same experiments uh, that you mentioned about greenhouse gases three years uh, before Tyndall. Uh, but the man was the only one allowed to talk about it at the conference. <laughs> yeah, no, a terrible, terrible example being set when yes. that happened. And I'm, I'm pleased to say we're making progress. Um, it's not fast enough. Uh, there's outstanding climate and ocean experts um, who are now at professorial level. I, I'm seeing in my own research group, it, it's always been an equal mix of PhDs and postdocs, and, and many of them are going on to DECRAs and future fellowships and faculty, and uh, it's changing. It's not changing quickly enough, but it's a great point, Herbert. Thank you for making it, and it's um, <laughs> a shame on, on the scientists of the day that that happened. Great. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. I'm going to now hand you over to Christy to give the formal thanks. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. It's a, um, a, a really great um, pleasure for me to thank you, Matthew, for your astonishing tour de force on climate change and its vagaries. I think what you've done is, is reminded us of what we want of experts and intellectuals. Not so many quick certainties and dogmatic assertions, but what you did was take us through the evidence and show us the complexity of the issues. I think it's a fairly sophisticated argument and, and, and yet like the very best of academics, you managed to make it comprehensible to those of us who don't know your area very well. In fact, by the end of your talk, I think it was almost impossible not to believe what you were saying. I think you were dealing with those questions with such clarity and knowledge. It was a, it was a really, I think for me, a great reminder in this year of, uh, perhaps slightly less than real respect for expertise. But I wanted to say something more. I, I listened to this speech first um, yesterday on, when it was recorded, and I spent the whole of the day driven back to Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mar Mariner, these great images of water moving across the, from, the, from, the Western, from the Eastern to the Western Pacific. It was really quite inspirational. The trade winds, those images are so important and, and are really very poetic. And I think perhaps that's something that we need to, to keep in, in mind as well. It was quite clear to me that you felt it very strongly about it in spite of your enormously um, scholarly and, and detached voice. That There was this sense of the excitement and the and the importance of these great oceans sucking up all of the heat for us, a very worthy um, uh, medalist, and, and, and thank you very much for your talk. I'd like just to finish with another thanks. It's been an extraordinary year for the Royal Society of New South Wales. In spite of the pandemic, there have been monthly meetings, lectures on a range of topics, all of them excellent, there was a forum, there are events at the house. There have been enormous numbers of events and we've had really good audiences as our webmaster has let us know. I didn't get involved in the events until the middle of the year when actually all the hard work had been done. And I want to thank the triumvirate who set it up. It was Judith Wilden, Stuart Midgley, who's on our screen, and um, Lindsay Botton, who between them utterly um, unpaid, I have to say, you know, purely voluntarily moved the whole of the Royal Society of New South Wales from face-to-face -face meetings to online meetings. Um, a huge amount of work and which has been incredibly successful. And I think that this is something that we need to recognise. So I want to say thank you to them.
In fact, the Zoom meetings have been so entirely cost-free to the organisation that when I said that I thought it was time for us to go back to face-to-face -face meetings, the treasurer of the organisation looked very miserable indeed and didn't want to do it because there were costs entailed by the meetings. I do hope we can meet next year, but I do want to say particularly a congratulations to Stuart, Judith and Lindsay, and my thanks to Liz, who's been the most able, um, I mean, you know, when one draws on a former um, Pro Vice-Chancellor from a, um, ANU as one's the Secretary of the Committee, you know you're getting a good deal and boy have I ever had one. So thank you all very much. Thank you and good night. <laughs>